Hello. Welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Yes, I am back. <laughs> I don't know if everyone saw my little note I posted on the channel. I don't know where those actually go, if they just go into some kind of like pit on the channel that no one sees, but I didn't post any videos last week because I had strep throat. That was really, really fun. And obviously I could not film any videos. So <laughs> I am filming two videos today. The next one's going to be published on Thursday. And then next week you're going to get like three videos. I basically have a couple videos in backlog that I have to post, but I'm also on vacation this week. So I'll be talking about that in my wrap up next week too. So anyway, what am I reviewing today? I'm reviewing The Ministry of Time by Kaylee Ann Bradley. This is a book coming out May 7th. It's from, from Scepter, Avid Reader Press, or Simon Schuster. I'm not really sure. This is a sci-fi romance book. I received this e-arc from NetGalley in exchange for a fair review, and I was so excited because it sounded so cool, and it was super cool. A deeply romantic sci-fi that also manages to raise interesting questions about colonialism, the Ministry of Time is achingly slow burn and deliciously satisfying. What is it about? In the near future, a civil servant is offered the salary of her dreams, and it is shortly afterward told what projects she'll be working on. A recently established government ministry is gathering expats from across history to establish whether time travel is feasible for the body, but also for the fabric of space-time. She is tasked with working as a bridge, living with, assisting, and monitoring the expat known as 1847, or Commander Graham Gore. As far as history is concerned, Commander Gore died on Sir John Franklin's doomed 1845 expedition to the Arctic, so he's a little disoriented to be living with an unmarried woman who regularly shows her calves, surrounded by outlandish concepts such as washing machines, Spotify, and the collapse of the British Empire. But he adjusts quickly, he is, after all, an explorer by trade. Soon what the bridge initially thought would be, at best, a seriously uncomfortable housemate dynamic, evolves into something much more. But over the course of an unprecedented year, Gore and the bridge fall haphazardly, fervently in love, with consequences they could never have imagined. Supported by a chaotic and charming cast of characters, including a 17th century cinephile who can't get enough of Tinder, a painfully shy World War I captain, and a former spy with an ever-changing series of cosmetic surgery alterations, and a belligerent attitude to HR, the bridge will be forced to confront the past that shaped her choices and the choices that will shape the future. That was a really long blurb, and it seems really spoilery, and in fact, I was kind of annoyed when I first read the blurb because I was like, oh, now I know the whole story. But in truth, it's, it's really not spoilery at all because it's a romance with a capital R, so that's the point of the book. Yet, this, this novel, if you're starting to get bored here, no, this novel is a romance in the way Pride and Prejudice is a romance, and that while the romance is a driving force of the story, the novel is also about more than just the love story. The plot itself isn't the most compelling. In fact, for most of the story, there isn't really a plot, just onboarding Lieutenant Gore into modern life and the narrator is pining for him. But the subplot regarding the narrator's wrestling with her heritage and that she's falling for a guy who was part of the colonialist regime and she is a mixed race person of color, so she has to reconcile with that, is compelling and very relevant to today's world. Of course, the romance aspect is great as well. The book is also very, very funny. <laughs> I will admit, when I first started the book, I was like, first person? No, <laughs> because I often find first person and romance to be rather unbearable. I think because I prefer to watch the romance bloom on both sides of the couple, to watch when and how they fall for the other person, rather than someone's like horny thoughts. But I will say once I got about 10% in, the first person tends to start working for me. And when I reached the end, the first person ended up making perfect sense for the novel. This is because the book is an epistolary novel. The narrator is writing to someone directly about what happened to her and the reason why she is doing so and how this plays into the aforementioned plots and subplots is very interesting when you consider the structure as the story begins to wrap up. It also allows for a hopeful yet open-ended ending that honestly is kind of perfect. It's one of those, I heave a great sigh kind of endings. You're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> In terms of the romance itself, oh my god. Anyone who loves Mr. Darcy will love this because Lieutenant Gore is absolutely swoon-worthy because he's a dude who learns from his mistakes and changes for the better. He's inherently, you know, a good guy, but obviously has some outdated ideas about society and women, yet he adapts and his prudishness is also kind of romantic in a way. <laughs> The love story is amazingly slow burn, but unlike the classic romance tales, we actually get a few sex scenes and quite honestly, one of the best first kisses I have read in a long time. I reread it like 
five times. It was so good. <laughs> and unlike spicy romances of today, we're not subjected to long descriptions of sex that, in my opinion, are kind of boring. Well, I'm not morally opposed to sex scenes, you know, I'm more of a build up and prefer half a page of closed door sex scenes compared to like seven pages of sex. Yet there is sex in this book. It's just, you know, a few scenes here and there. And it really, it really worked. It had like the perfect balance of what I prefer, which is like, seeing the romance build and the tension hitting the boiling point, that kind of thing, and spice. <laughs> so in my eyes, to sum it up, the romance was great. <laughs> also, this book rather indirectly deals with ships, which if you follow my channel, you know I uh, absolutely love boats. <laughs> Lieutenant Gore is one of the people of real life person, this dude, not bad looking, I might add, uh, who died as part of the Terror and Erebus Franklin expedition. If you had the pleasure of reading, um, Oh, I have it. I had it on my desk, but I'm not going to get up and get it. Um, The Terror by Dan Simmons, who is the author of Hyperion, which always for some reason confuses me. I don't know why. Um, or if you're a history buff, or if you have watched the AMC show The Terror, you'll, you'll know the story. But if you don't know any of those three things, basically these two ships tried to find a Northwest Passage in the 1840s, and everyone died after succumbing to cannibalism. It's, it's a lovely story, you know. <laughs> if you haven't heard of it, it's a fascinating expedition, and there are tons of documentaries on it. The Terror is a horror adaptation of it that is also still historical fiction. The, the show is really good. I really enjoyed it. If you enjoy fish out of water elements, you'll also get a kick out of this because most of the novel is acclimatizing Gore and a few others, Arthur, oh my god, I love him, uh, from their societies to the modern world. I find this incredibly fun, so if you also like this, you'll love that aspect. Can you tell that the only rom-com I've ever really enjoyed is that one with Hugh Jackman, uh, Kate and Leopold? <laughs> It's true. Normally I can't stand rom-coms. Like you can't pay me to watch one. Like my friends would be like, let's watch this. And I'm just like, uh, uh, can I just play Clash of Clans on my phone? <laughs> but that one, I had to watch it at the video store where I worked as a teenager. And, uh, I will admit that I actually really liked it. Probably because there was all those fish of water elements and fish out of water elements. And because it had to do with time travel. So yeah, I haven't watched it in probably 15 years. Does it hold up? Who knows? Maybe I will watch it. And then my husband will think I've gone absolutely insane. Anyway, the writing in this novel is absolutely lovely. The narrator herself is a bit of an old soul, so while the writing is contemporary, it retains an almost literary feel at times that reigns in the story nicely. Here are two lines to entice you. These are from an arc, so the lines may be removed or altered in the final printing. He got out of the car and looked up and down the street with the weariness of a man who has traveled across the continent and has yet to find his hotel. I just thought that one was kind of funny. It's kind of like shows you how kind of tongue in cheek funny this book is. It's also a British book, by the way. So there's that kind of humor to it, if you like that. And then there's this one. I wasn't all right. At close range, I could smell his skin, even through the cigarette smoke. His grip on me loosened. His hands hovered along my back, lighter than the passage of dragonflies over water. So sweet. <laughs> there's also this line that killed me. He lives in me like trauma does. Oh, and there's also a subtle reference to Wilfred Owen, one of the World War I poets. I studied him in university and I absolutely love the World War I poets, so that was a great addition to the story and it made perfect sense as the one character is from World War I. It also subtly alluded to that character's own mental state and I was like, oh, it's so smart, I love how this all ties together. So, because nobody asked for this, here is one of Wilfred Owen's poems. It's kind of dark, but Owen did die literally one week before the armistice, so, you know, he'd been through a lot, the poor guy. So this is Dulce et Decorum Est. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick, boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim under the misty panes and thick green light under a sea green, I saw him drowning. In all my eyes before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. 
If in some smothering dreams you two could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. I love that poem. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Anyway, if you couldn't tell, um, because I've been rambling about random things in this in this uh, review, which means I really like the book because it means it made me think of other concepts and things. I adored, I adored the Ministry of Time. If you like time travel, if you like uh, books of you know people being brought into the modern times from the past and having to adapt, uh, if you like romance, and well, if you just like an engaging story with interesting characters, you will likely enjoy this very much. I just I just loved it. I just loved it. So thank you again to NetGalley and the publisher for the eARC. Uh, yeah. <laughs>